stand by. We're three, two, one. Academy Hour. I'm so excited because this week we have our first ever assistant director in the hot seat telling us all the great things uh, that assistant directors do and how they keep us together as a community and uh, not spinning off the face of the earth. So stay tuned. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. Hey guys, I'm Joelle Smith. Uh, Pega Rad is out on commit she's doing things she has actual like human work to be doing um we miss her greatly hopefully she'll be back soon but you guys don't have to worry because tony schwartz is here uh tony schwartz is a producing staff at the new york film academy here in uh burbank california i almost said my hometown which was weird it's is <laughs> does nifa have a uh, campus there yet <laughs> they do not. we will we will at some point uh if you're interested in cornfield and a uh, <laughs> place where two rivers converge you know check it out <laughs> a lot happening there um tony if people you could just go check out tony short's imdb page um and you'll be stunned you've worked on incredible like i don't want to say it like giant like boulders in the river of cinema like um running michelle's high school reunion but also like firefly firefly was probably my favorite experience uh of of my 25 year career well yeah we're gonna get i'm gonna i'm gonna keep my composure um, i'm gonna keep the nerd in check we will talk <laughs> about that later um let's start off with the first question we ask every guest which right. is when did you know you were in love with cinema um, when I was a small child, um, I loved movies, although I, I, I didn't have a desire to work in the film industry. Uh, that came when I was in college. Um, my uncle uh, was, a, was a dancer and then a choreographer and then a producer. Um, so I was around and, and exposed to movies and we talked about movies in the family. My mother was a stage actress, so I grew up, I was a theater brat. Uh, grew up down in Orange County at South Coast Repertory uh, Theater, oh, wow. uh, where my mother was a member of the company. And um, it wasn't until college um, when I was um, in, I was a business major and wow. utterly miserable. <laughs> and I think it was my, my second or third semester when I was in the middle of business law class and I thought, you know what, I don't want to do this. I don't really like this. And I was taking a general ed mass communication class um, about movies and television. And that was the moment when I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to do this. Heck yeah. Okay. So let's walk it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. You were in love with cinema as a young kid. What movies was it like? For me, it was like Christmas and Halloween because I got to watch cool horror movies that my older cousin showed me that I shouldn't have seen. And then Christmas is my mother's favorite time of the year, so we watch all these like really great classic old black and white movies. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my introduction to film. What movies uh, were you getting into that were like really keeping in your seat? I mean, I was I was watching movies that probably the average kid around my age wasn't watching. One of my favorite movies still to this day is a movie called All the President's Men. Yeah. Um, which is a timely movie um, about political corruption. It sure is. Something, uh, something we know we're what? dealing with a, a little bit now. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Shocking. Um, you know, uh, The Godfather was, a, was a, a, a huge favorite of mine when I was, when I was young. Uh, you know, Francis Coppola is probably my favorite filmmaker. That final shot still haunts um, me. Uh, it, he, he in, in, a, in a three or four year span, he made four of the greatest movies ever. Both of the Godfathers, Apocalypse Now, and a movie called The Conversation, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, all terrible experiences, except for The Conversation, which didn't he direct that essentially behind a wall? Um, was that the one where he was like almost completely removed from set? That I don't, that I never heard. I remember, I just know that The Godfather was such an awful experience for him personally as he's being kind of followed around by producers and his replacement. Um, and then, of course, the total chaos that was shooting Apocalypse Now. Right. I, I um, use that in my classes. I actually, uh, I use that as a, as a sort of a, a cautionary tale for filmmakers. That's... It's a good one. It it's remarkable a that, that it's as great a film. I mean, it is my favorite film. Uh, and it is remarkable that it is such a great film based on, on the experience of making it. So all of these films have a very uh, dramatic, heavy kind of tones. Were you a very serious kid? Um, no, I actually was kind of a class clown. <laughs> um, so maybe I balanced out the, the class clown with the serious movies. I love it. So in college, you're um, sitting in business class, which I'm... Yeah. Would love to talk to you later about how that feeds into. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> Which 
is specifically how it feeds into assistant director. I feel like there's probably a lot of lessons to learn on the business end that oh, might have helped. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting take because, yeah, I mean, uh, you're an AD. You are really a manager. I mean, you are running the show from an administrative standpoint. You know, um, a friend of mine, actually one of the one of my friends uh, who teaches at NIFA, and I've known him for 30 years, um, said is, uh, to describe what the AD does, uh, the director is responsible for everything after action and before cut. <laughs> and the first AD is responsible for everything else. So no pressure, guy. Yeah, yeah, Just no pressure. So many things. So how, when you go into film, are you, and is she like, a, yes, an assistant director, which would be uh, one of the first times I've heard anyone like, yeah, I entered the film world to be an assistant director. I didn't actually seek that out. That sort of found me. It sort of happened. Um, I, when I was in college, you know, I was making films. I was really interested in sound. Um, you know, I mentioned The Conversation and Apocalypse Now, two films with unbelievable sound. Um, Walter Murch, who created the sound uh, for both of those films, uh, a genius uh, film editor, but also a genius with, with audio design. And I was working um, in the theater department at school. Um, I was doing a lot of the audio for the live productions. I was doing sound mixes for my, my classmates' films. Um, and so when I got out of college, I started working as a production assistant, met a sound mixer on the second movie I ever worked on, uh, made friends with him, and he introduced me to a buddy of his who owned a post-production sound house and called him. They were looking for interns, and I thought, this is it. My career is, is, is taken off. And I started the internship, and the woman who ran the internship hated my guts. Oh, no. I have no idea why. Maybe because he was the one who brought me in, and she didn't. Um, but for whatever reason, she made my life miserable during this six week internship period. Dang. And I got fired from the internship, which is pretty hard to do. It is nearly, it's your free labor, it's yeah. nearly impossible. Oh so my goodness. needless to say, I was, I was pretty devastated. Um, and I was sitting at home in my apartment, uh, just feeling as low as I had felt in a long time. And I got a call from a production coordinator. Uh, who I had worked with on a film, and she said, uh, I'm on a movie at Fox. Or do you want to come work in the office? And when the movie starts shooting, you can go work out on, on the set with the ADs. And I said, yeah, I'm in. I needed a job. And Amazing. so I started working, and the first AD on the film uh, took me under his wing. Is this Texas Chainsaw Massacre? No, this was a movie called How I Got Into College. Okay. And uh, the, the first AD was a guy named Bill Scott, and he took me under his wing and mentored me and showed me what the first AD does and how important the first AD is. And he was such a he was such a, an amazing human being, just a wonderful man, um, great AD. And by the end of that film, I had decided I wanted to be an AD. I wanted to be Bill Scott. Wow. And so I I love sound. I still love sound. But at that point, I had. I was putting all my energy into being an assistant director. So when do you get your first like paid assistant directing gig? That was Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. So cool. Epic, epic film. Um, a miserable experience. Um, six weeks of nights shooting up at Indian Dunes in Valencia. So, oh, wow. Um, and, and when you shoot nights in Valencia, you're, you're always driving in traffic. On your way to work, oh. you're in rush hour. On your way home, you're in rush hour. For California, uh, that's our own personal hell. And and so, <laughs> it was six weeks of that. Um, no and I was uh, I was working for a really tough first AD who was uh, sort of um, I think she sort of decided I was the guy she was gonna pick on, like I was gonna be her target. Okay. And so it was it was a pretty unpleasant experience, but I made it through and. Uh, Started, I worked my way up from second, second assistant on that to second assistant director on some low budget films, One False Move, um, and then gradually worked my way up to first ADing and then also line producing. Okay, so I have to ask because I'm a total film nerd. Mm -hmm. um, I know that for the first Texas Chainsaw, they used a lot of like animal skins, mm -hmm. like like most of the furniture where, where everything was made out of human skin, it's really like pig flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hear that in the heat, 
of Texas when they were shooting the first one, that house got pretty rancid. Are we dealing with the same kind of we, set pieces? So because we were shooting nights, the whole story takes place at night. So we filmed everything night for night. So we were in the middle of summer, but at night in Indian Dunes, it cooled off. Cooled, nice. It cooled down. So we didn't really, I don't remember dealing with that. We had, you know, a very short night. If, mm. you, if you can imagine, it doesn't get dark until about 8.30 and then it's light at about six. six so yeah, we wow. had about nine hours and that we also had to eat during that time. So, so this is all like running gun then. Yeah, yeah, Incredible. very much so. Yeah. Um, I know for a lot of people, horror movies are the first movies they do. It tends to be a trend here mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of our guests, the very first film they work on is horror. What does horror, doing horror productions kind of prepare you for, for like larger, bigger, but bigger I, budget sets? I absolutely loved working on horror movies. I worked on, on uh, a few Texas chains. So I worked on a, a movie, a Wes Craven film called shocker, which was a really great experience. Was Work, it the working one Wes Craven with, film I haven't seen. Working with Wes, uh, was, was really special. He's such a, I mean, he's, we just lost him. Yeah. Um, but he was a really wonderful guy to be around. Just a lot of fun. Um, we would go bowling and he came out and bowled with us. What? Uh, yeah, just a, he was a really down to earth guy. Um, I always loved horror movies. For one, you know, you're 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 dealing with guts and blood and gore, and you know, if you've worked on a horror movie, you know, it's it's cherry syrup <laughs> and ground beef, and it's you know, it's a little gross when you're got your hands in it, but you know, it takes some of the. It, uh, they're not scary at all. They're yeah, really no. fun, and you you just I I, I feel like you bond on mm -hmm. those kinds of movies you know you're laying around you know the actors who are laying around in a you know a pool of blood for 10 hours a day i think like especially um, low budget shot during the summer tend to have like a summer camp feel a little bit about yeah. them movies in general uh, you know have that feel you know you're you're thrust together mm -hmm. you know for long hours for you know two three month stretch um with a group of people and you hopefully find that bond and you just you know you discover the love in that in that group um, and that's a really great experience. Sometimes you don't, and then you just you can't wait for the movie to oh, end. Gosh, those are harrowing yeah. experiences. It can't, it can't end fast enough. But you can learn a lot from those experiences Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about transitioning from film to television. I know, mm -hmm. like for directors and writers, particularly, the jobs are essentially the same, but also vastly different. Is that the same true of an assistant director? You know, T. So ading is ading. Uh, whether you're on a film or you're on a TV show, mm -hmm. the the. The responsibilities are the same for the most part. The job description is pretty much the same. Um, the difference is in your relationship to the director and to the producer. In movies, you, you, your alliance is a little bit more to the director mm. than the producer, although it depends. It always depends on who the director and who the producers are. Um, in television, episodic directors come and go. And so you're, you are really working for the producer. And so your job on a TV show is to help that director who comes in and generally knows the show some, sometimes they know the show really well. A lot of times we'll get directors who come back and, yeah. they know, and they really do know the show. But a lot of times directors come in and they don't know the show and they really lean on their ADs and their crew to, to help them through, you know, in terms of dynamics, you know, that's a really important thing when you're on a, a TV show that's been shooting for a while, th there's a there's already a fixed crew dynamic and, and set dynamic. Got it. And, ca you know, with the cast and with the crew, and a director comes in and they don't know any of that, so they really look to the AD to, to say, hey, you know, tell me about this show. You know, who do I have to look out for? What's the, what's the dynamic on set? What's the tension like on set? Um, and that's where we really can, can help. So you guys are kind of like, Gatekeeping is the wrong word, but I know like the cinematography crews are rolling over. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, you're just essentially the leader, like the point person for the entire set then. Yeah, I mean, you know, on TV, there's two ADs. Um, we alternate. So one is prepping while one is shooting. That makes sense. And then, and then sometimes there are two DPs, but a lot of times there's only one DP. So the second is actually the, the glue because they're, they're on every episode. Oh, wow. And so you're talking to the second about what just happened on the episode that you were not on because you were prepping with somebody else. 
And then, so because you've got to deal with some of that tension or some of that stress. Let's or... pause here to talk about the distinctions between each uh, like kind of le- tier of director. So uh, a second assess- second second assistant director, yeah. uh, what is their role on set? Their role is really, in most cases, to support the first AD. They're, they're the ones who are going to be on set right next to where the first AD is. The first AD is at the camera. That's, that's your focus right. at, the, at the center of the set, which is the camera. Second second is sort of out on the periphery, dealing, helping get information to people, keeping the set quiet, wrangling people, making sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, the first AD is feeding information to the second second, feeding information to everybody on the radio. You know, this is what we're doing now. The next shot is this. We're two shots away from moving over to this set. Make sure everything is cleared. Let's make sure the props are on. You know, it's, it's a, a constant flow of information. Um, the second assistant director, sometimes you don't even see the second AD uh, on set. Maybe comes, comes once to talk about the preliminary call sheet, and then maybe at lunch, maybe a little bit after lunch, and that's it. Second AD is dealing with tomorrow, making sure all the arrangements for tomorrow are getting organized, coordinating with the production office, dealing with all the department heads, getting information, manpower, um, and so, and, and it's an incredibly important job, um, but you, you're not on set a lot. You, you tend to be on the periphery, you know, the outer edges of the set. So some common characteristics of people who might go into uh, this field of work, obviously you need to be organized, obviously you need to be forward thinking. Uh, what other kind of like natural characteristics is most people have who are holding a down assistant director You jobs? have to know how to read personalities. You have to know how to deal with a wide variety of personalities. You have, I, I know this will come as a shock to you, a lot of egos in, in Hollywood. I know, <laughs> I was shocked too. Um, and so understanding how to deal with a lot of competing egos and knowing the hierarchy, knowing who's really got the power in a, in a given situation. Um, you know, the other thing I think that's really important, a really uh, a key characteristic of a, of a good AD is whether you're feeling that pressure or that stress or that anxiety or outright fear that you are not going to make the day, um, you got to hold that in as mm. much as you can because the crew sees that and they feed off that. So, you know, if you can keep your head about you while those around you are losing theirs, you know, the Rudyard Kipling poem, I think I quoted it relatively closely. Um, that's a really important thing. Um, you know, there have been plenty of days <clears throat> when I'm, I'm dying on the inside. Yeah. And you try not to let that out. Okay. Maybe you go to the bathroom and you, you know, have a primal scream and let it out and come back. And okay, let's hit it. Let's, let's get back to work. You know? Cars are great cri- primal scream uh-huh. zones. Uh-huh. Yeah, just take a little drive around the block real quick. Um, okay, let's let, we can nerd out now. So uh, you're on Firefly, mm-hmm. it's like one of the greatest two early canceled shows of all time. Um, Absolutely. What you said earlier that you love was one of the greatest experiences of your career. What specifically made it one of the best experiences? Well, aside from the fact that it is, it's just a great show, just unbelievably great show. Joss Whedon is such a talented writer, and he is he's just he, he's a brilliant guy. Um, I, I think the thing that made that show so special, the crew was wonderful, but anytime you're on a show where you have a number one on the cast, like Nathan Fillion, mm-hmm. he sets the tone for everybody. Sure. And he was absolutely one of the most unbelievably great people to work with. Yay, that's so wonderful. You could not get him to leave the set. Like, Nathan, we have stand-ins. We, no, 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 I'm okay. All right, well, you got to shut up. You know, because he just, he was always talking, having, I mean, that, that set was so fun. It was such a special place. And what, and then as news started to, you know, the rumors were kicking around sure. that we thought, you know, we weren't going to make it through the season. The network, they would do, you know, you're, you're on a series and generally the way it works is you have the pilot and then they order 12 episodes. And then you find out at some point during that first 12 episodes being shot, whether or not you're going to get the back nine ordered. Sometimes you don't get the back nine, but you don't get a cancel. You get, you know, six or they'll order six or they'll order five. We were getting one. 
Jeez. Like they were literally like doling out an episode. Okay, here, here, you get another episode. And so we were, you know, needless to say, there was a lot of um, anxiety sure. um, on set because we thought, okay, we're probably not going to make it. And at a certain point, we all just sort of embraced it. Sure. And, and we were just waiting for the hammer to, to fall. And I remember the night that it happened. We were we were shooting. We were on our, I think we were on the Abbey, which is, if you don't know what the Abbey is, it's the second to the last shot of the night. And Tim, my near, and Joss came down and said, hey, we just, we just talked to the network and it's official. We're done. And we, we were just like, all right, you know what? We're going to, let's just wrap. We didn't even finish. We didn't even oh, finish wow. the day. Yeah. Wow. And so I'm trying to, ending? I'm trying to radio up to the production office that, uh, okay, we're just going to stop now. Um, we, I mean, we, we came back the next day. We, sure. we still finished the episode, but nobody wanted to work anymore. You it's got to be so disheartening it when was. you know it you're was... working on something great and you're like, yeah. Give this a minute to find its audience. Mm -hmm. it go gangbusters. Um, yep. It, it is uh, always fascinating to think about what would have happened if that show had been produced like in the world of like Netflix and online streaming and stuff. You have to imagine it would have just it been have, Yeah, it would have been a different, different time. You know, um, Fox really wanted to be in business with Joss and they, and they really were happy to, to be, be in, in business with Joss. That was the first thing he had just signed an overall with with Fox, and that was the first thing that he decided to do. They freaked out. They just panicked about mm -hmm. it. They couldn't figure out what it was. It's a western. It's a science fiction. What are we doing here? They didn't know how to promote it. They stuck us on Friday nights. Oh, boy. They wouldn't Death air sentence. the pilot, which was um, so confusing. Yeah, yeah. So the pilot ended up airing, I think, in Third the or something? no. I think it was even later. I think it might have been. The sixth or the seventh episode. What are we even doing, yeah, guys? Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing that introduces you to a... That was when we were at doing episodics, too, yeah. and everyone was confused. It's like, well, an audience will care. Week to week, yes. Yeah, I mean, I was involved in another show like that, um, Freaks and Geeks. Oh. Another one. That show is incredible when you look at the talent on set, the amount of people who go on to have just vibrant careers. It's incredible. Uh, they're so, oh my gosh. Uh, I believe it's on Hulu right now. Look at all the baby faces. Like it's Seth Rogen mm -hmm. is there, James Franco, Busy Jason Phillips, Siegel. Jason Siegel. Linda Carlini. Oh my gosh. Sam, uh, Sam, uh, Levine. Sam Levine. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Daly. Um, just, Martin uh, Starr. Incredible, incredible yeah. production. Martin Starr. Rashida Jones. I always pass up Martin Starr in that cast, but he mm -hmm. is brilliant. Uh, he is on mm -hmm. uh, Silicon Valley now. It's yeah. wonderful. Rashida Jones uh, had a, a two or three episode arc on that. Shia LaBeouf oh my God, came on baby. and did, did one or two episodes. Um, who else? Um, it'll come to me. Um, I'm drawing a blank. I can't remember. Oh, Ben Foster. Oh, my gosh. It, it <coughs> front to back incredible again canceled way way too soon mm -hmm. um i guess i just want to ask you like walk me through a day of either freaks and geeks or uh, uh firefly like what did you how does your day start and where does it end so well fire so firefly was a unique situation because we were almost entirely on stage we were it's so so episodic television hour long generally eight day schedule eight days of shooting and we were generally either seven on stage one out mm -hmm. per episode sometimes we didn't even leave the stage um so that we had a little bit of leeway and latitude in terms of getting our scripts uh early which we never did um so um first day of prep uh so i would finish my episode and i would go up to the upm's office and say uh all right, you know, uh, am I coming in tomorrow? And he'd say, no, nah, we don't have a script. You know, call in at the end of the day, and we'll see about the next day. And so I would generally get four days off oh, at home, paid, sitting around, which was great, except then on day five of prep, you would get half of the script, you'd get an outline, and you have to, you have to schedule. You have to map out what you're going to do with half of the script oh god um now if you're only on stage you have a little bit of freedom you know you sure. can leave a set and come back and you're not killing you're not trying yourself. to secure a location yeah, exactly um and so that's what we did we would we would i would schedule what i had and sometimes mm -hmm. we would start shooting and i wouldn't even have a complete script 
and then I would get this, the the rest of the script the first night, you know, after the first night of shooting, and go home and break it down and map out the the rest of the shoot. So it was it was challenging from that respect, but as I said, unbelievable crew, unbelievable cast, and you just loved being there. It was it was just like one of the greatest experiences that I had. So tell me, how do you get into teaching after all these incredible experiences? Um, ADing is really hard on on your personal life. It's hard on it's hard on your physical life. Mm. You know the the amount of time you're on your feet, the lack of sleep, the amount of pressure that you are under. Um, you know, I always tell my students that um, the average life expectancy of DGA members is 56. So I'm second I'm, guessing being a part of the union now. <laughs> what? Um, so I'm 55 now. I'm gonna be 56 next oh month, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to being on borrowed time. Um, no, in in all seriousness, you know that was one of the that was one of the things that I was thinking about as I was approaching my my 50s. And I have small children, and I wasn't seeing them. My kids are now 13 and 10, and I wasn't getting to see them. I wasn't able to be around them, and. It was a tough, you know, it was a tough decision. It was a tough decision because I absolutely loved what I did. I wouldn't have done it had I not, yeah. had I not loved it. Um, but it was, I think it was the right time and teaching happened uh, kind of by accident. I, um, back in 2007, the writers went on strike and the town shut down for about six months. I remember and that. so there was nothing to do and I, took that time to, I started getting together with a buddy of mine and we started developing ideas and working on stuff of our own. And so we've still, still got, I've got a feature that we're trying to get back off the ground. We had to shelve it for a while. Um, and I'm working on some TV ideas. Um, and so I'm still doing that, but the day-to-day -day production, um, I just thought, you know what, maybe it's a good time to, to take a step back. And, um, for one of the features that we were developing, um, we were consulting with um, a guy named Adam Finer. Hey, Adam Finer, yeah, who who introduced me to uh, then um, uh, film department chair John Terry, and I started, uh, I, you know, my first semester. I'm coming up now on my six year anniversary. Wow. Um, but I was teaching two classes a week, and that just kept growing, and I was pretty much full time after uh, almost two years. Then I was the producing department chair for a couple of years and then decided I wanted to get back into the classroom. So step back down and um, just teach in full time. So we have time for one last question. Mm -hmm. and I want to ask you for students looking to go into assistant directing who maybe yeah. even haven't started school yet. Is there anything that they can be doing now to start preparing themselves for that life? Um, other than just getting the experience while they're in school, get on set. You know, one of the one of the best ways to learn how to be an AD is to just get a really good sense of how a set operates. Watch the process. You do that, and you know, I started out as a production assistant, and that's again a really great way to learn how the industry works. You know, I PA'd on three or four features. Um, I got got to PA on on some really good features. I, I was a production assistant on Steel Magnolias. That's incredible. And went on location. It was my first time on location. So three months on location in Louisiana. Um, uh -huh. I learned a lot. Um, you know, you you in, make friends with the ads and and show them that you are eager to learn and do whatever job you get with a smile and a good attitude. Um, it goes a long way. Um, you know. ADing is a tough job, mm -hmm. um, and so start on start on small projects. Work your way up. You know, get your get your get your bearings on a on a one or a two day shoot. You know, just you know getting comfortable running a set, and then getting comfortable organizing the shoot. And you know, it just keeps expanding. And ADing is ADing. You know, the job is the same whether you're on a fifty thousand dollar short or a five hundred million dollar feature. You know, the job is the same. You just have more, you have more, more tools and more people that you have to deal with. But, you know, that's a good and bad. You know? So get out there start practicing, yeah. make movies with your friends. Tony, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us today. This was incredible and I learned so much. I had a good time.
Thank you so much. Uh, guys, next week is Thanksgiving, so we're going to go be with our families. Um, but join us the following week. I believe we're going to have Peter Rayner coming in talking about some of the best ho holiday films of all time. So it should be a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.